Antarctica holds untold secrets. Fossils of unknown types, bacteria and viruses trapped in the ice, and plenty more treasures all hide beneath the continent of ice on our South Pole. One of the many which have been studied and identified is the Blood Falls, consisting of crimson fluids which gush out of a particular glacier every so often, creating a grisly sight perfect for a sequel to The Thing. Let's hope the world doesn't need that sequel. If we were to take a trip to the frigid wasteland of Antarctica, we'd almost instantly start the process of freezing to death. But if we were prepared and decided to check out the eastern section of the continent, we'd be in for a shock due to how damn cold it is. But if we decided to take a quick jaunt to the McMurdo dry valleys of Victoria Land and then hike to West Lake Bonnie in Taylor Valley, we'd come across something of a crime scene. A crime scene that appears to begin many kilometers below the ice, away from our point of interest. At sporadic intervals, this glacier will squirt out bright blood-red liquid onto the ice sheet atop the lake directly in front of Taylor Glacier. Though the liquid looks a hell of a lot like blood, there's no butchering of animals on this historically quite animalist slice of ice. No, that ain't blood, it's hypersaline water, colored red, by what is essentially rust. But it ain't your ordinary rust. The reddish deposit was first observed by Australian geologist Griffith Taylor in 1911. He was also the first to explore this valley, which is now named after him. When he saw the blood falls, he figured it was red due to the presence of red algae, a super bizarre division of eukaryotic organisms which use phycobiliproteins rather than chlorophyll to produce their food. Turns out it ain't red algae that causes the rusty color, but the ions responsible for real rust you get when you leave a sheet of metal outside. There's iron ions in the water, and when it comes in contact with air, they become bright blood red. Antarctica is an ice sheet covered continent and has existed for about 25 million years. It's been covered in ice since the last ice age, 2.5 million years ago to 10,000 years ago. During the Miocene epoch, about 5 million years ago, the continent was less ice covered and the world's sea level was higher. A pocket of the Antarctic Ocean was trapped in a fjord as a glacier, now Taylor Glacier, moved over or through it. The pocket was then covered by the glacier anywhere from 2 to 1.5 million years ago, with the water and organisms inside becoming a time capsule. The water that was trapped was seawater, so it had a high level of salinity, or saltiness, higher than just fresh water. The reason that water became as strongly salty as it is today, which is 2 to 3 times that of average seawater, has everything to do with freeze and thaw cycles. When seawater freezes, it expels the salts and just freezes the water, so the seawater trapped below the glacier would freeze a little bit and leave some water behind. That water would get all the salt that didn't get frozen. Over time, this made the remaining body of water become more and more salty. As this occurred, whatever was living in the water had to adapt. It had more than enough time to do so. The microscopic critters in the water, namely bacteria, have been there since day one. Over time, these little guys evolved isolated from the rest of the world, so cabin fever changed them. Some folks have collected samples of the fluid from where it exits the glacier. Turns out the bacteria living in the red liquid adapted to metabolize sulfate and iron ions. That means they get their energy from the chemicals that became concentrated in the super salty pool. It was either adapt to that or die. So, you know, bacteria did what bacteria do. According to geomicrobiologist Jill McCucky, the liquid contains at least 17 different types of microbes and just about no oxygen. A possible explanation here is that the microbes used the sulfates in the water to breathe with the iron ions. They then would metabolize any organic matter trapped with the iron and sulfate. This has never before been observed in nature. In 2014, a more direct method of sampling the red liquid was taken by Jill McCookie. 
This method involved a robotic probe which melts through ice. The team used it to bore a hole from on top of the glacier into the pool to collect uncontaminated samples. Obviously, this could contaminate the liquid, but would be less so than the stuff splooging up at the front of the glacier. Those samples said the water is damn cold at negative 7 degrees C, iron rich, and 8% sodium chloride. They were able to assign some of the microbes to already known taxonomic names, Marinobacter, Thiomicrospira, and Desulfocapsa, all of which are different than their already known cousins. This discovery has huge implications for early life on Earth, as well as life out there in the cosmos. Evidence in the rock record, including glacial sediments, banded iron formations, and glacial striations, shows that the Earth may have been completely or nearly covered in ice around 750 to 650 million years ago. A snowball Earth. The existence of this refuge of ancient microbes in Antarctica shows us that microbes could have easily survived the snowball Earth. The ancient microbial refuge offers a great natural lab in which to study how microbial life forms may survive extreme conditions in the deep subsurface of other planets. Mars and Europa, for example, have large deposits of ice, under which may live some extremophile microorganisms like what we see in the blood falls of Antarctica. Thankfully, the microbes oozing out of this salty brine beneath the ice are harmless. I can only imagine what other, nastier surprises might lie dormant under the ice. With the rate of anthropogenic climate change, I'm sure we won't have to wait long. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my elephant tier patrons, Thea Svensson, Staniforth Hopkins, Dinosaur, and Arda Bayer, as well as my Tyrannosaurus tier patrons, Henry Brennan, Danny Van Heck, Dana Manchester, Chris Frampton, and Admin.